All right, well, go ahead and take a seat. And as you're sitting down, I would encourage you to take your Bible and open up to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, we're in this incredible gospel, and if you've been with us, um, you know exactly where we're at and what we're diving into. If you haven't been, we're actually in the middle of a story. We started it last week, and we're, Lord willing, going to finish it this morning. The story is found in Mark chapter 7, it goes from verse 1 through verse 23. And so I'm going to read the whole story, and uh, we are going to focus on the second half of the story this morning. It's Our focus will be particularly verses 14 to 23, but I'm going to read the whole story once again, starting in verse 1. Mark writes, The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him, and when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed for the disciples and, I'm sorry, the, the Pharisees and all the Jews, do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And when they come from marketplaces, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and pots. Well, the Pharisees and scribes, they asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. And he was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say, given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down. And you do many such things as that. After he called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, evil, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things, all these evil things, proceed from within and defile the man. Rabbi Tobias Geffen could probably hardly have known what lay await for him in his career as a rabbi when he became a rabbi in Atlanta in 1910. Uh, Why was this so critical? Well, he became the leading expert on the decision about whether Coca-Cola was kosher. Coca-Cola was bottled in Atlanta, and he was the uh, resident rabbinical expert And what's interesting about this whole story of whether Coke was kosher or not uh, is it involves a modern reality of manufactured foods with certain chemical makeups and a combination of that complexity with millennia of tradition. The oral tradition that would have determined whether something was clean or unclean or whether food would have been considered kosher or not uh, goes back to even before the New Testament, but The oral tradition wasn't written down until the 6th century in the Babylonian Talmud, and then 
that kind of took on a life of its own. And by the time you get to the 16th century, um, a rabbi kind of created a, a major definitive document that kind of encapsulated what it means to be clean versus unclean. Uh, the, real, the real crux of the issue is the separation of acceptable foods and unacceptable foods. And those two things must be made distinct and kept separate. And even the foods that are acceptable have to be slaughtered a certain way, prepared a certain way. And so there's certain ways you can do something to a clean food to make it unclean. And then there's, of course, a third category called parva, which is a neutral category that can be enjoyed with, with uh, the food as long as it's in the clean category. So here comes R Rabbi Tobias Geffen, and he's uh, questioned by the Jewish community, can we drink Coke or not? And that's the uh, question that lay before him. And so he starts to talk to Coca-Cola Bottling Company, and he even finds out the secret ingredient. He was sworn to top-notch secret security so that he could find out all of the ingredients. And as he began looking at each and every part of Coca-Cola and how it was bottled and how it was packaged, he uh, started to realize that uh, Coke was not on a kosher trajectory for the simple fact that it was produced with a glycerin uh, glycerin is just a, a kind of a syrupy, it's a slightly sweet liquid, and it's, it's, used, it's used in all sorts of things. It's used to diffuse flavor. It's used to uh, prevent ice crystals from forming in ice cream. It's used to uh, keep cakes moist and fresh. So Coke uses glycerin in its, in its drink, and he finds out that the glycerin being used was an animal-based glycerin. And so it was used uh, from um, fatty oils generated from uh, processing that had cattle and pork and everything else. And, and so he's looking at this and he says, look, this, this can't be allowed. This is not kosher. It's interesting that um, the challenge, uh, part of the challenge of weighing in on this uh, decision using a modern 20th century marketing, manufacturing, and chemical components with 2,000 years of tradition on weighing in on whether a food is clean or unclean is there's a rule called bitul, which is the rule of nullification. And this is a rule that, if, and you know, you're going to be experts in this by the time I'm done with this illustration, mind you. So just buckle up, we're almost there. Um, this rule called bitul is a nullification rule that allows you, in case you may, there's an accident in the kitchen, to not have to throw out an entire meal. So let's just say you're making um, beef stew, and uh, you have some butter and a little a uh, pat of butter falls into the beef stew, and you grab it, and you get it out of there. Uh, well, now, is that meat in its mother's milk? Because you can't combine meat and dairy, or it's no longer kosher. And so the rule of bitul is, a, it's a 1 60th ratio. So as long as the milk product that went into the stew is less than 1 60th of the uh, final quantity, you're okay. Bitul comes in, nullified. You can continue on with your meal. So I guess if you dropped in like pounds and pounds of butter, man, you got to start over from scratch. You know, you just went across the 160th threshold. So with the Coke situation, it's actually quite interesting that the amount of glycerin to Coke is 0.01% of its volume. So technically it's less than the bitul principle, but it's not that easy. Rabbi Geffen weighs in and says, the difference is bitul is in case of accidents. This is deliberate. And so that was, an, that was the ruling. And Coke, quick to not, they didn't want to lose uh, the market uh, to, to anybody, and so realizing they would lose their market to observing, observant Jews, they decided to go ahead and use a vegetable-based glycerin so that it would pass kosher status. And in 1935, after contacting Procter & Gamble, getting them to start selling them a kosher glycerin, continued making Coke, and Rabbi Geffen stamps kosher all over Coke, and so the Jewish community rejoiced. Until the 1950s. In the 1950s, major scandal broke out to find out that Procter & Gamble had been producing their, their vegetable-based glycerin in the same pipes and the same machines that we produced. The, ve the vegetable and the animal glycerins are produced in the same machines. And so all of a sudden, it became a major problem because this important kosher principle named blios, literally just means taste, applies to the touching of unclean and clean foods because it could even affect the taste. And so no longer being kosher, Procter & Gamble 
spent the $30,000 in the 1950s to create a parallel piping system to have separate pipes for their vegetable-based glycerin and their animal-based glycerin. And then finally, it was restored back to kosher status. This culmination of the story of kosher Coke and the decisions that go into that process demonstrates human religion at its finest. This is a profound display of the rigors of religion that have maintained a top-notch standard for defining in human terms, with human definitions, what it, uh, what's allowed and what's not allowed for the worshiper. This profound display of human religion is very unfortunate because it has the disastrous effect of causing worshipers to think that they are clean in the eyes of God when they haven't even begun to evaluate the proper criteria. That's the whole point of this story in Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7 is a profound story that defilement and my standing before the Lord is not an issue of externals, it's an issue of the heart. The antidote to being deceived by human religion is to have the true criteria of what actually defiles someone before a living God and knowing that and knowing what makes you clean or unclean. If you know that, you will be immune to human religion because mark it, Jesus makes it patently clear in verses 14 to 23 that the heart is what defiles the man. Maybe better, the defiled actions that flow out of the heart prove that the man is defiled because his heart is corrupt. If you have a religion that cleans you up on the outside but has no answer for a corrupt heart, it has no answer, answer for a sinful nature, you have a man-made religion that is hopeless and helpless and you will stand before the Lord without an answer for your heart. This is an incredible story, and it starts with this showdown with the, uh, his, his religious enemies in verses 1 through 13. We looked at that last time. What I want to focus on this morning is the last half of this story. In verses 14 to 23, the scene changes. The scene changes, and Mark starts to document what happens as Jesus is calling the crowd to himself. And if you notice in verses 14 to 16, it's really short. It's the story of what he says to the crowd. So it's still a public scene, but it's no longer this showdown in front of the Pharisees. Then the scene changes once again in verse 17, and it's privately between Jesus and his disciples in, in a house. And so uh, in verse 17, they start asking him about the parable that he shared with the crowd in verses 14 and 15. And so that's really the whole, whole story develops around these two scenes. This is a, an exposure of human religion and a discussion of man's true problem. And, and mark it down, um, if, if you misdiagnose your problem, you, you're going to settle for false solutions. Every human religion is only successful on the basis that man does not know his true problem. If you understand that your problem is that at the core of your being, at the core of your heart, your inner man, you are defiled and you are flawed and you are corrupt. You will be miserable until you find your solution in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pick it up in verse 14. He called the crowd and he calls them to him again and he begins saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. He's pleading with the crowd to just make sure that they listen and understand. Hear my words. Listen to me. Understand what I'm saying. Get the implications of this because he just had this showdown with the Pharisees. They've been taught by the Pharisees. I mean, the Pharisees are the religious leaders of the day. And without thinking uh, critically or thinking biblically, their view of God and their view of self will be what they were handed by the Pharisees. And so he's telling the, the public, listen to me, get understanding. And he's giving them, as we just sang about, the words of life. This is deliverance from the false religion that they've been suffering under. Listen to me and understand there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. There's nothing. There's nothing that can be put into you Placed into you, it's not that you ate the wrong thing, did it at the wrong time, 
uh, we're in the wrong location. You just, no, no. It's just nothing that can defile you externally, circumstantially. But, Jesus says, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. It's a very simple parable, and it really just functions on the very black and white contrast of inside and outside. What's outside of you? What's inside of you? That very simple dichotomy played out in this parable makes the difference between all human religion and true revelation from the living God on the pages of Scripture. Every human religion has some sort of solution, and the problem they are diagnosing is inevitably outside, external. Only biblical Christianity identifies the problem as the heart of man and provides a solution for a fallen, corrupt, and depraved heart. That's the simple difference. Parable's over, and then they move on. Now notice in verse 16, it has in brackets, if anyone has ears to hear, uh, let him hear. Now that's in brackets because that um, was in the earliest English versions going all the way back to, to Tyndale, and even the, the Wycliffe, Wycliffe, you're getting it from, from the Vulgate, but it's not in the earliest manuscripts, probably is not original to Mark's writing, uh, but even if, it, and it's in later manuscripts, it's, it's not that they're just making this up, but most likely it's not original, and even if it is, it's just a great sober conclusion, which he often used when he makes a very pungent statement that they need to consider and pontificate on. And, and so here in verse 17 now, Mark switches scenes, as I mentioned. Now, they go to, into a house, and the, the disciples are still curious. They want to know more. It says, when he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, and listen to this, are you so lacking in understanding also, I mean, the, the also here is he just got through explaining to the crowd after they saw the showdown with the Pharisees what was different between true revelation from God and man-made religion. And then he explains this parable so that they can clarify it. And he's saying, make sure you listen. Make sure you understand, verse 14. And now they're asking him questions. And it's a little bit of a rebuke. I don't, it's, not, it's, not, it's not sinful. It's not impatient. It's not undeserving. Uh, Christ is infinitely patient. But it's an appropriate rebuke. Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into a man from outside cannot defile him? Jesus is saying, consider this, guys. What could you possibly name that would defile you? What could you possibly eat? What could you possibly drink? And they might be thinking, oh, well, we could go to the Old Testament and show you all sorts of things. And this starts to get into a um, uh, an issue that might, might seem very warranted for their confusion. Because after all, they, they, they read the Old Testament, they live the Old Testament, they study the Old Testament. There are such things as unclean foods. Read the book of Leviticus. And so they might be saying, well, uh, well, we'll just go to the Bible. What are you talking about? What is it that outside of man that, that cannot defile him? And Jesus' point is, because it does not go into his heart, and literally, this phrase, it's, inter it's actually a very interesting phrase. I was looking at this. Um, this particular verb often takes, a, takes an object in a certain case, and it literally can be translated because it does not go into him, comma, into the heart. That's the most literal way to understand what Jesus is saying there. Why does stuff outside of you lack the capacity to defile you? Because it doesn't go into you, that is, what I'm speaking of is, namely, into your inner man. He doesn't have any power to defile you. On the contrast, it goes into your belly, and it's eliminated. Literally, it goes into the, into the toilet. That's, the whole, that's all it does. What does that do for your soul? And so thus, he declares all foods clean. Now, this addition, this comment, this parenthetical comment in verse 19, thus he declared all foods clean. It's a, Mark's obviously adding that to what Jesus said, because obviously Jesus didn't say that, because it's referring to Jesus in the third person. Um, so Mark makes this comment, and it's, it's helpful as he's documenting his thesis that Jesus is the Son of God to a Gentile audience. He's explaining that to the Gentile Christians. That obviously would have been a, 
uh, an issue for them. I mean, this is uh, Gentiles coming into a uh, re- history of redemption that have started with the Jews. And as we read about in the future here in the book of Acts, what's coming up after Pentecost is you have Jews and Gentiles in the same um, body and it's starting to produce uh, differences. They're starting to have questions about table fellowship. Can we eat with so-and-so? Can we enjoy a meal with so-and-so? And these um, food laws are actually dividing them. And so Mark makes the helpful point that, look, what Jesus is saying here is pointing out that all foods are in and of themselves clean. Now, of course, this, starts, this can sound a little bit confusing or it gets a little challenging when you think about Jesus saying this in the Old Testament economy before Pentecost to note, uh, observing Jews. The disciples are devout Jews. They're not going to violate God's word. And this is, this is what's important to consider. Jesus is making a statement about the inability of external things to defile your heart because it doesn't go into you, into your inner man, into your heart, into your soul. Obviously, any violation of God's word is defiling. He's already said that in verses 1 through 13. Uh, You're actually, to the Pharisees, he's saying, you're actually creating rules and you're disobeying what God actually said. So he's not saying that violating God's law does not defile you. Of course, that would be the case. But he's saying the food in and of itself cannot defile you. And so disregarding any law of God would obviously be disobedience and reflect a rebellious heart. Lenski comments this way, and I found this helpful. God, but, God did in the, uh, but, God, but did God in the Levitical law not forbid certain foods of the, for the Jews, and would not eating such food defile a man? The answer that Jesus is here abrogating the Levitical law is unwarranted. He himself fulfilled every requirement of it as a Jew and retained that law for his disciples until Pentecost. The answer is that it was not the food as food entering the mouth that made unclean, but man's disregard of the Levitical law, which had been given as a Jew, given to him by God. The disobedience he would be uh, voicing by asking for such food and in justifying his eating thereof. That's the problem. The problem would be violating God's word, not the actual eating of that food itself. And that's the point that Jesus is making here. And Mark's just making a comment that's helpful for his Gentile audience generations down, uh, a generation later. Verse 20 to 23 is really going to be where we need to spend most of our time this morning. In verse 20 to 23, we start to get a little bit of a picture of what's in Jesus' mind about the difference between clean and unclean. If you think about that complex story, that's kind of amusing, the story of how Coke became kosher that I started with. You think about the complexities, I even threw a few principles at you you probably never heard of. I'd never heard of them before. This is a, this is a better list. Jesus just says, listen to me here. If you want to know how to evaluate where you're at with God, Am I clean? Am I unclean? Am I defiled or am I not? Here is your list. Before we dive into this, this list, it's called a vice list, appropriately so, because it's just a, vi- a list of vices. As we look at verses 20 to 23, it's extremely helpful, but just consider this vice list needs to be a replacement of the like, kosher law or of what, would, what we would imagine to make us clean or unclean, or make us right before the Lord. Think about this. We cannot presume that we're thinking soberly about every aspect of our relationship with God just because we have the Bible. The Pharisees had special revelation. They they devoted their lives to studying the Scripture. We can even pervert and twist, if we're not careful, pervert and twist God's pure revelation If we're not careful, we can start to think about ourselves in flattering ways. We can start to think about ourselves in ways that would actually put us in more positive light than is warranted. And if we have the wrong criteria, we will go astray at this very fundamental point of, am I on good terms with God? Would he view me as clean or unclean? And so before we look at this list, just think about this. 
the Jews came up with a list of, of standards that they would follow and observe because one of, the, one of the rabbinical responsibilities was to fence the law. Like we fenced the table. We fenced the table of, God, of, God, of communion. They fenced the law. They said, look, here's the list of requirements that we do. And we, if you follow these requirements, then you are safe inside the bounds of the Old Testament law. They fenced the law. And so think about it that way. They're trying to fence the law and they're creating these man-made rules to see how they're doing. And here comes Christ with God's evaluation, with God's standard of evaluation so that we can actually look at our soul. And if you have any doubt in your mind, or even if you are secure in your assessment of what God thinks of you this morning, look no further than Mark 7, 20 to 23, because it will show you what God sees when he looks at you. This is what you must avoid. If you do not want to be defiled, you must avoid these things. It's that simple. If you want to be defiled, you must avoid these things. Are you ready? Verse 20. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of a man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, and you can see this list, starts in the middle of verse 21, goes all the way through verse 22, and this is going to become our checklist this morning. Here is how we evaluate ourselves. If, you're, if you want to be clean, if you want to remain, if you, if you want to imagine that you are undefiled, avoid every single one of these things, and you'll be fine. From within, out of the heart of men proceed these things, and they defile the man, verse 23 says. So let's go back to our first checkpoint. The first one is evil thoughts. Evil thoughts. This, the word thoughts here just refers to your reasoning, your opinion, your thinking. It's, it's your designs. It's what happens in the inner man as you calculate and you consider something. Um, this is all the rational thinking, all of the considerations, all of the plans that take place in the inner man. And specifically, when these plans, these considerations, these reasonings are evil. And consider that um, reasonings or lines of logic or ways of evaluating yourself and ways of evaluating others, they could rest entirely on your own reasoning, and that would be evil. Because now you've made a judgment of a neighbor and you're not their God. These are the these are the judgments that belong to God. And we, in our rationalistic minds, start to rest on our own reason as an authority. And now we've made ourselves to be God. Wicked. That is wicked reasoning. Think about this. God calls us. Here, here's the standard in God's law. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. All my mind. So if, if I could somehow come up with a life where every thought that passed through the neurons of my brain was always and only worthy of God's glory. That's not that exceptional. That's just simply appropriate. That's just simply what God deserves. It, it, that's not praiseworthy. Not, oh, wow, look at what you pulled off. No, of course you should think that. Like, God created you. Any thought in your created brain that falls short of the glory of God, you are not loving God with all your mind. Do evil thoughts come out of your heart, out of your mind? Have you ever had a line of reasoning or a mental course of consideration that displeased your creator, the judge of the living and the dead? Have you ever had a thought that was ungrateful to God? Have you ever had a thought in your brain that doubted God's goodness? Doubted his perfection in your affliction or in your trial? Have you ever relied on your rational ability to come to a satisfactory conclusion rather than to just rest in God's revelation? How, have you found yourself in your mind exalting created things rather than the creator. Well then, know for sure, know for certain that these evil thoughts 
come out of a defiled heart. Evil thoughts defile a man. Second, look at fornications. Fornication, the Greek word is porneia. It's just a term that refers to unlawful sexual intercourse. And it's, sometimes it's translated prostitution, unchastity, unchastity as, as well as fornication. In any sexual act outside of biblically defined marriage, one man and one woman who are committed to an abiding and exclusive marriage status, anything outside of that is fornication. Sexual activity that violates a marriage covenant is, of course, adultery, and that's actually coming up later. Uh, This is any sexual activity that occurs outside of a marriage context, regardless of one's single or not. Have you ever acted on a sexual impulse? Know for certain that this defiling fornication was produced in your heart. Next, Jesus says, thefts. Thefts, of course, involve stealing property, resources, or goods. It's uh, wrongfully taking something that doesn't belong to you. It it can even include not just tangible property. It can include intellectual property, taking anything in an illegal way, using it for ill-gotten gain, uh, even using someone else's patent to make profit off of it without paying them a contract price. Uh, It could be not rendering time due to your employer. It could even be pilfering, pilfering resources from from someone else or, or from an employer that aren't actually for that purpose. And pilfering has the idea of like a skimming operation, you know, taking something and then just using it for selfish gain to kind of help cut into, make, get, you know, pad your budget a little bit. I mean, think about this. If, we, uh, if we're honest, have you, ever, have you ever even bought a soda and then just shared it? and said, well, it's just a good way to save money. If you don't like the price of soda, don't, don't buy a soda. This is stealing to take anything that's not rightfully yours. Such thefts are produced by a defiled heart. Next, murders. Murder or killing. I mean, Jesus has already connected the dots between murder, the heart behind murder, and the heart behind hostility. In Matthew 5, verse 21, following, he says, you've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering before the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar, and then go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent." Consider that hostility toward a brother is heart murder. Human religion dresses up the externals. It regulates in, uh, the manifestation of murder. It regulates the, the extent of murder. And it even has rules that prescribe how hostility could or could not be carried out. But only Christ's religion has a cure for the defiled heart that produces such murderous intent. The end of verse 21, the last one there is adulteries. And we already talked about this. This is the, uh, an, an act of violation of a marriage covenant. And Jesus has already connected the dots between adultery and lust in the heart. In Matthew chapter 5, he says, You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Looking at someone with lust is heart adultery. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It's better to lose one of these parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. I mean, could it be any more clear 
we are not talking about suggestions here. We're talking about the delineating distinction between those who are in heaven and those who go to hell. If you want to avoid defilement, just avoid this list. We're almost done. I mean, we're almost halfway done. Verse 22. Deeds of coveting. The word just means the state of desiring to have more than one's due. And maybe we even say, maybe even improve upon that, saying more than one's possessions. The desire to have more than you have. It's a greediness, it's insatiable desire, it's avarice, it's covetousness. It's the desire for more. The issue is desire. And, and um, again, the word, you know, the word in verse 22, it just says deeds of coveting and wickedness. And, and that's because they're struggling to translate this plural noun that's just coveting, coveting, covet, covetings or covetousnesses. So if you could turn covetousness into a plural, covetousnesses, I think I just doubled it, sorry. If you could do that, that would be the best translation. So they went with deeds, which is a, you know, a much better English. But the challenge with that is, is it's not actually just the deeds, it's just this covetings, these desires, a pro- proliferation of desires. And so you might even just say uh, the, the, the desires for more out of the heart proceed desires for more. This is a defiling, a defiling uh, life. Asaph was jealous of the wicked because he saw how prosperous they were in Psalm 73. And he looked at how well they prospered. He looked at how, how everything they touched turned to gold. They didn't have problems. They didn't have troubles like those who were trying to live pious lives. He's looking at his integrity. He's looking at the complexity that's introduced to his life. It's made his life much more difficult to actually fear the Lord. And he starts to say, I was envious of the arrogant. I saw their prosperity. And in verse 7 of Psalm 73, he says, their eye bulges from fatness. Their imaginations of their heart run riot. I mean, this is coveting. They have all these imaginations of what they want in life. Their eyes are bulging out of this coveting desire of wanting more. They just want to keep devouring and, and desiring, and they're never satisfied. Have you ever desired something that God hasn't given to you? Have you ever desired something that God gave to someone else? Such desire defiles. If you're asking the question this morning, am I naturally defiled or am I naturally pure? Look no, diff- look no further than covetous desires. Another thing that defiles you is deeds of wickedness. And this is... Uh, any deed of avarice, malice, ill will, impure motive, any harm, deeds of wickedness. Next is deceit. This just means to take advantage through a device or an underhanded method. It's usually translated deceit, cunning, treachery. Uh, In certain contexts, it's even translated just simply as bait for fish. It's even used of the Trojan horse. In Greek literature, this word, subterfuge, it's a covering for a pretense. It's one motive disguised as another motive. There's a deception there. You've ever covered up motives, dressed them up to make them look pure in the eyes of someone else so they wouldn't see what was actually happening? That defiles you. Next, sensuality. Sensuality is just a lack of self-constraint. And it, 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 basically, this is a, a life that's out of control. It's a life of self-abandonment. It's a life that's licentious. It's even given over to wanton violence. Um, this, this refers to doing what pleases your senses. That's why it's called sensuality. So pleasing your senses. And that could involve all sorts of things that would touch on uh, diet and um, um, addictions and everything else. Uh, the, the most common way this word is used in the New Testament is with regard to sexual sensuality. Here's a couple of examples. Romans 13, verse 13 says, Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. Ephesians 4, 19 says that they have become calloused 
they have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. And that's describing somebody who's given over. They just are so committed to doing what pleases their own senses that there's no more restraint. There's no more borders that can be crossed. They just have erased all borders. 1 Peter 4.3 says, The time has already passed. Uh, the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And those obviously, you probably heard the word because you're listening for it. All of those translations use the word sensuality. Here's one that doesn't use that word, Jude 4. Listen to this. This goes beyond just mere um, sexual impropriety. This would cover it in a, in a more broader sense of the term sensuality. Jude 4 says, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of God into, here it is, licentiousness, allowance, permissiveness, freedoms, and they deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. That's the word sensuality right there. If sensuality has come out of your soul, then now you know what that means. Human religion may give you an excuse. It might even give you a right or some sort of ceremony, some sort of right of absolution to try to feel better about it. But the truth is this proceeds from within. Sensuality is not someone else's fault, it's yours. And the answer to a problem that's outside of you is much different than an answer to a problem that's inside of you. And if sensuality defiles you, it defiles you because it comes from your heart. Envy. Envy. This is literally in the Greek. An evil eye. An evil eye. The issue here is lack of generosity. It's a focus on self and the stinginess and the greed that goes along with it. Let me show you an example of this in Matthew 20. Remember the, uh, the tenants? In Matthew chapter 20, verse 15, G Jesus is telling the, st the story of this um, um, man who had hired all of these workers. And if you remember, the, the, the hiring happened throughout the day. He hired some people at the beginning of the day and three hours into the day and six hours into the day and then even hired some uh, last section of the crew with one hour left. And so, if the last hour was five, five o'clock, people who worked for one hour got hired at five, they get paid, and then the people who were, who were there from 6 a.m., they're looking at how much the, the five o'clock crew got paid, and they're thinking, wow, we're going to really roll in the dough today, and they get paid the same amount, which was what he agreed to pay them to begin with, and they got a problem. They said... Uh, they said, uh, these men, verse 12, these men have worked only one hour and you've made them equal to, with, with us who have borne the burden and, and the scorching heat of the day. In verse 13, Jesus says, friend, I, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a day? A denarius? Sorry, not, I think I said Jesus, but he's telling the story. This is the, uh, the landowner, the farmer who's hiring them. Verse 14, he says, take what is yours and go, but I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own, or is your eye evil? Is your eye envious because I am generous? If you look at your life and you've seen a deed of stinginess for selfish gain, you are defiled. Next, slander. Slander. Slander is the word blasphemia, speech that uh, denigrates or defames somebody. It tears them down. It disrespects them. It's a word of evil. It's profane. It's irreverent. And then, of course, when it's against God, it's just flat out blasphemy. Have you ever used your words to tear someone down, to denigrate them? You're defiled. Next is pride. And this is technically the only occurrence of this word in the New Testament. But its adjective is familiar. You remember James 4, 6 and 1 Peter 5, 5, speaking about God gives grace to the humble but is opposed to the proud. That's the adjective form. Same, same root there. The word is a compound word. And in the Greek language, takes the word for appearance, 
to appear or the appearance, and then the, pro, the preposition to above or beyond. And so to appear above, to appear above someone else, to put yourself above someone else, to carry yourself that way. And it means arrogance, haughtiness, pride. It can even be used to show contempt towards someone. And so this is a posture of putting yourself above others. Now, in the Old Testament, it's interesting. We should not be numb to how significant the sin of pride is. You know, the word, words like abomination are used in the Old Testament for things that are just against nature. You know, um, inappropriate and just almost unheard of types of impropriety and wickedness are called an abomination. You know what else is, it, else is it called an abomination in the Old Testament? Pride. Abomination means something that's so loathsome it would turn God's stomach, if I could use an, an, just a, an anthropomorphism there. Proverbs 16.5 says, Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. Listen, if, if you look at your life and you've seen haughtiness or arrogance toward man or toward God, you're defiled. Because that came out of you. Last is foolishness. Into verse 22, he just says foolishness. It's the state of lack of prudence, lack of good judgment, lack of sense. Solomon said that uh, the foolish young man will die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he will go astray. He also said, here's a few that give you an, a, 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 a picture of what folly looks like. Proverbs 18, 2, a fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. So there, folly equals infatuation with revealing your own mind. Proverbs 18, 13 says, he who gives an answer before he hears, it is a folly and shame to him. So somebody who answers the case before it's been heard, or he makes a conclusion based on one side only, that is folly. That person lacks sense. Proverbs 19.3 says, The foolishness of man ruins his way, and his heart rages against the Lord. So folly is a life-destroying enterprise marked by hostility toward God. Those are three marks of folly. If, if you've seen a foolish, life-destroying, self-infatuated lack of sense flowing from within, you are defiled. How are we doing? is clear. Jesus is so clear. He concludes in verse 23 by saying, all these things proceed from within and defile the man. All these things come from your heart. In this story, Jesus gives us what we need to distinguish true religion from false. And there are so many human religions. Worse, there are so many human religions based on the Bible. And sometimes it can be difficult to know the difference. Think about this. As we go about our day, as we go about our week, every moment, every event in our life, we start to process it. And even in our downtime, we have thoughts and we have a worldview and we have a perspective about God and ourself and our neighbors, and our family, and our children, and our responsibilities, and our work, and everything else. And your view of God, and your view of the world, are critical. And here, Jesus is showing us that we, could, we might be operating according to a, a human religion, or we might be operating according to biblical revelation, and we need to know the difference. Sometimes the difference is hard to tell. I remember uh, a friend that I was with, buying a watch from a street vendor. We were buying these cheap, you know, trinkets on the, from a vendor. And then this guy comes up and, you know, gives, show, opens his coat and shows him a, a tag hewer, you know, with a sweeping hand. Hey, you want this one? He's like, yeah, yeah. So he buys this thing for hundreds of dollars. And we take it, take it home and he went to sell it to a vendor. And the vendor, a licensed vendor of this particular watch, had to spend uh, about an hour on the phone with a licensed representative to find out it was such a good copycat. The only way they knew it wasn't original was because when he flipped it over, there was a swivel plate on the back that that company had never manufactured before. And sometimes when we start with the scriptures, 
We have a way of thinking, a way of reasoning, a way of talking about God and ourself and our status and whether we're clean, whether we're not clean. I just make these assumptions. I'm sure God has a positive view of me. And the question then becomes, well, how would I know? How would I know? Only Christ was willing to confront the mass of humanity against, in rebellion against his father. And he was alone willing to confront them with the truth that they were by nature hostile to God and defiled in their heart, and that the solution cannot be external. He did not offer them external solutions. He pointed to the diagnosis that the problem is the depraved heart. The reason why what's listed in verses 21 and 22 defile the man is because it's the immediate litmus test and production of your heart. And so here's some questions for you. I'm going to list these questions, and we're going to end with this. These are the questions you need to ask yourself. Questions for your religion. Questions for how you think about what God thinks of you. Number one, does your religion expose what is defiled about your heart and soul and mind? Does it expose that? Or does how you think about yourself, is it, is it primarily just what other people think of you and how well you fit in? That's connected to the second question I want you to ask. Does your religion help you in the sight of men or of God? Does your religion help you in the sight of men or of God? Does your religion help you feel better around people? Does it, or does it, does it actually deal with what God sees? Does it actually help you with guilt? Does it actually um, remove guilt? One way to say it might be, does, this, does your religion mask your true problem or does it solve your true problem? Third, does your religion change behavior or your sinful nature? Does your religion change behavior, or does it change your sinful nature? Does your religion attempt to fix the externals, or does it transform you from within? Listen, 10,000 years from now, eternity will be established, and everyone in this room will either be in one place or the other. At that point, it's too late to ask the question, am I defiled or not? It's too late. We'll all know. We could be defiled and, and not know it. And Christ is so gracious to give us the litmus test right here. Say, this, this is what would defile you. Look at this. You can know before it's too late. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 says the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating joint from marrow, soul from spirit, judging the thoughts and intentions of the heart before him with whom we will give an account. Only the word of God can expose the heart and show what would defile us on the last day. When we stand before the Lord, friends, that's all that matters. Where will our religion leave us when we are standing before the judge of the living and the dead who knows everything we've thought, everything we've done? That's all that matters. Human religion will leave us empty-handed at that point. And so if we, if we don't truly believe that our heart is defiled, and that if we don't believe that that's the problem, we will be hoodwinked by man-made religions. We will flatter ourselves to our grave. And Christ doesn't want that for us. He's so gracious to come along as the Messiah and say, here's your problem, and here I'm your solution. If you've heard that test, and you know, maybe in a fresh way, maybe you've never even heard this before, maybe in a fresh way you're realizing, I am totally defiled before the Lord. Trust me when I say that Everyone here at this church who's truly a part of this church worships the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He was never defiled. And he died on a cross so that he could forgive those who were defiled. If you've seen these deeds produced in your life, human religion will leave you empty-handed on that last day when you stand before the Lord, but Christ will never leave you ashamed when you stand before the judge of the living and the dead. Christ died on a cross and was treated by his father as though he lived a defiled life so that he could give you a status of clean, so that he could forgive you for internal guilt 
and send his spirit to actually give you power over these defiling acts so that your life could increasingly look like his. That's why we worship Jesus Christ. And so if that's true of you this morning, that you're starting to realize for the first time that you're defiled, then please come talk to me afterwards. Please come talk to one of the, one of the pastors or um, talk to the person who brought you. This is, this is eternity hanging in the balance of this test of what you're worshiping. Father, we're so thankful for the clarity of your word. And this morning, Lord, as we, we've, come, we've come to worship you, and here as we worship you by paying attention to your word, you minister to us once again. You continually serve us and benefit us and grace us. Uh, even when all the glory ought to go to you, we keep getting all this benefit. Thank you for benefiting our hearts this morning and our souls, for showing us the dangers and the emptiness of a human religion and by showing us man's true problem. And I pray, Lord, that um, this would ca- keep us um, clinging to you and clinging to your gospel. Lord, don't let us appeal quickly to some sort of gospel of mere forgiveness and imagine that if we are still living in a way that would be characterized by these sins, that somehow we, we are not defiled. You were very clear, Lord Jesus, when you spoke on that uh, 2,000 years ago, when you spoke these very words, you were very clear that it's those deeds that defile the man. They do defile us because they reflect what's, what's in the heart. Only you are in the business of giving clean hearts and transforming lives so that we actually can yield a will to walk in righteousness and walk in obedience and actually glorify your name, not just by forgiveness, but also by righteousness. Lord, there are so many in the name of Christ who have a form of religion but deny its power, and they're still defiled by these deeds. And if they're in here here this morning living that way, I just pray that these words would cut them to the quick. Lord, no human can, can help Help us when it comes to salvation, and thankfully so, because you're the God who saves. I pray that they would appeal to you directly right now. Even as I pray to you, I pray they might be pouring out their hearts to you, begging for salvation, because they might realize for the first time that they're defiled. And Lord, thank you for being such a gracious God. Thank you for saving those who are unclean. In your name we pray. Amen.